Good Thursday morning. Today is November 3rd, and you're listening to Thy Strong Word, the program where each weekday morning we explore the Holy Scriptures through which God bespeaks us righteous and nourishes our faith. I'm your host, Pastor Phil Boo of St. John Lutheran Church in Laverne, Minnesota. Welcome, friends, listening on AM 850 in St. Louis, online at kfuo.org or as a podcast. Be sure to spread the word about our program to anyone you know who would benefit from a daily dose of God's word. We give thanks to our sponsor this morning, as always, the Lutheran Heritage Foundation. They translate and they publish biblical and catechetical material for people all over the world. Learn more about their great work at lhfmissions.org. I love hearing from you too. I answer every email I receive. So send me your questions or comments to pastorboo at gmail.com. That's P-A-S-T-O-R-B-O-O-E at gmail.com. Every Friday, I feature one of your letters at the top of the show. Well, in this episode, we are continuing to unroll the scroll of St. James's letter, and now we are on chapter 3. Even those who have true saving faith, a, a faith that is lived out in good works and love toward one's neighbor, can still run into trouble. And one of the most challenging things for people to do is to control their tongue. With the things that we say, we can lead others astray, hurt other people, even destroy relationships. Therefore, we need to temper our speech with God's wisdom. But what does that look like? Well, with me this morning as our guest is a faithful teacher of God's Word, the Reverend Timothy Heineke, pastor of New Life Lutheran Church in Hugo, Minnesota. Pastor Heineke, welcome to Thy Strong Word. Thank you for having me, Pastor Boo, and we're glad to be able to join you and to dive into God's Word together. Yeah, I'm excited too. You know, uh, Pastor Heineke and I, for those at listening at home, we know each other from seminary. So we got graduated at the same time. And even for a while, our first calls were within hours of each other. But, Pastor Heineke, you have been a pastor longer than I have. Isn't that right? Oh, that's true. I had the uh, the distinct honor of being able to uh, be ordained uh, just hours before you. So yes. I was able to come on and to uh, put on the stole and come on down and be a part of your ordination, even though I'd only had a stole for a couple of hours at that point. <laughs> Yeah, as, the, as you at home probably know, ordination ceremonies, pastors of the area come to lay hands on the one being ordained. And that's not only a biblical posture, but it you know communicates to the congregation the unity that pastors have in their calling. But yeah, Pastor Heineke was ordained just a few hours prior to me, so he was able to drive down, lay hands on me, bestowing upon me wisdom from his I think four hours of being a pastor, <laughs> but you know, I uh, Pastor Heineke is an excellent pastor, especially with the seniority that he has over me. I'm happy to have you here today, brother. Um, you're not at that first call anymore, neither am I, but you are down in Hugo, Minnesota. Uh, share with the listeners a little bit about how God's working through you and your congregation down there at New Life. Absolutely. Uh, I have the honor to be able to come on down to uh, New Life and to take the call here. I'll be just about six years ago now. Uh, New Life is right on the edge of the Minneapolis-St. Paul, the Twin Cities area. Uh, we're kind of right on the edge of country and suburban sprawl. And uh, it's, it's a neat community uh, in that it's growing rapidly, which is obviously very exciting and a neat place to do ministry. Uh, it's also an interesting uh, dynamic in that we're, we're right close to a major metropolitan area, you know, with all the employment and fun activities and all that that comes with a large metropolitan area. And yet we're kind of like tucked out of the way. Um, it's it's a partial bedroom community, and yet we're right still kind of a part of the city's area. And so it's it's a very neat area. And so we've got a lot of housing, a lot of schools, a lot of young families. Uh, but we, it's an interesting dynamic in that we don't have uh, college uh, nearby. And so, you know, kids graduate high school and then they go off to school down the road or elsewhere. And then it's oftentimes not until they're... Yeah, in their mid thirties before they can afford to move back into the area. So we've got pretty much every demographic in the area, except for that kind of 
20 to 35. Uh, and as a congregation, we're also reflective of that. You know, most of our membership is all across the board in terms of different ages, different backgrounds, different situations that people come from. Uh, but, you know, there's not a lot of the kind of the 20 to 35 because there just there just isn't any of them in the area. And so it's it's a very neat cross-generational place to be able to do ministry. Uh, it's a neat uh, church family where they're uh, heavy into service and especially heavy into the word. Uh, they love gathering and, and Bible study and asking just great meaty questions about God's word. So it's a it's a very exciting and neat place to to do ministry and to be able to uh, be of service to the community. Well, that's great. You know, with that wide uh, that wide diversity of people, except for that small little group that you were talking about. I'm sure it keeps you busy and you get to see all different parts of the Christian life experience. And I think that's something that people may not understand because when you're at a church, for instance, you and your family, you're in whatever stage of life you're in. As pastors, we're trying to minister to people in all sorts of different stages of their life. And that's one of the things that I think brings a lot of joy, at least to my own ministry, being able to see everything from the babies born to uh, sending off people to Jesus and their funerals and everything in between. And so it's wonderful to hear that your your congregation seems to be thriving and 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 growing according to God's will. And so yeah, I and and knowing you, I know that they have an excellent pastor, and it's no wonder that they are um, interested in Bible study. Uh, speaking of Bible study, though, uh, maybe we should get into our word today. We don't have a ton of verses to go through, but they're really important. Um, but before we begin, would you like to start us off in prayer? Gracious God, we thank and we praise you for the incredible gift of your word, that your word shares with us what we need to live, what we need to uh, have our lives saved by your grace. And your word is also an incredibly practical book uh, that in the Bible you share with us your practical words on how you've wired us up and how you've designed our lives and our relationships to be able to thrive and to prosper And so, Lord, we thank you for the incredible gift of your word, and we ask for your blessings to be upon us as we dive into your word here together. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, folks. Well, our text today, as you know, is James chapter 3, and it's divided into roughly two sections by the editors, at least of the ESV, and we have Taming the Tongue and Wisdom from Above. So this first section goes through verse 12. I'd like to go ahead and read those, get them out there for us to discuss. So here we go from the English Standard Version. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. But if we put bits in the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire. A world of unrighteousness, the tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. Now that's the end of our text. You know, as we've already discussed in the first two episodes, James's book is almost a proverbial in the sense that there's not a whole lot of rhyme and reason as he goes from one topic to the next. But in chapter two, he is talking about, you know, true faith, which is shown forth by good works. 
And now he's starting to talk a little bit about what that faith looks like, beginning with the tongue. But even before he gets to that, Pastor, he says, not many of you should become teachers. So are there a a lot of folks that are trying to be teachers in the church at this time? What's going on? Why is James bringing this up? Well, that's a very interesting kind of verse. And and I like how you said it too, that James is is proverbial. It's kind of sometimes called like the Proverbs of the New Testament. And, and so James is writing to people here who come from a believing background. You know, he, start, he starts out with a book talking to the, the 12 tribes and the dispersion. You know, kind of a, a fancy way of saying that he's talking to people who, who grew up in church. Uh, some of the letters in the New Testament are written to people who are new to church or new to the faith. But James is writing here to people who grew up in church. And they, you know, grew up in uh, going up to Sunday school and confirmation and worship and Bible study. And they, they know what it's like to be a part of a, a church family. So then it makes it all the more interesting that then he's, you know, he's coming off of talking about this, you know, connection, this inseparable connection between faith and works, that what you believe cannot be separated from how we act and how you act is a reflection of what you believe the, the two go hand in hand. So then he just kind of fires right in here and was saying, well, not many of you should become teachers, my brothers. And it sounds like a, like a very harsh and blunt way to come across. And so it helps to remember that, you know, in the first century at this time too, they didn't have a credential system established in Christian churches Uh, and different denominations. have got different ways of doing uh, credentials nowadays, Uh, even in our own church body, the Missouri Synod, you know, we've got uh, ordained and commissioned and you can be rostered, you know, where your name is on a list uh, that you've kind of got that so-called kind of like stamp of approval to say, all right, this guy's, this guy's on the list Um, or this person can take a call or serve in a church. Well, they did not have that infrastructure set up yet in the first century. And so they would have people coming into town and they'd say, hey, guess what? Uh, I'm an apostle. Yeah, yeah, I know what I'm talking about. God's got a word for me to share for you. And the people would be like, oh, oh great. Hey, come on, come on down. And hey, how, how about you kind of lead worship and have a sermon this Sunday? And then afterwards, and sometimes people would be like, eh, I don't know, was that, was that guy legit or not? I'm not sure. And so sometimes they'd have people coming into town that, you know, were not legitimate and were kind of coming up with their own stuff to share. And so he's, uh, so the James is here is talking about like, well, not many of you should presume to be teachers. Now the Greek behind that does does you know, it's really means teacher. And sometimes we uh, then translate and use that word uh, nowadays as, as pastor. And so he starts off kind of using them as an example about as how our words or how we use our words matters. And teachers are a great example of that because that's literally what they do. They teach. They use their words to instruct and influence others. And if someone teaches someone wrong, that's even worse uh, if, some, if a teacher were to teach uh, kids uh, algebra the wrong way, when they'd get to the next grade, they'd all be failing uh, because they, they were taught wrong. They wouldn't understand. Mm. And it's so much more true with our faith uh, because these, these are matters of life and death. And so he starts off with this kind of stern warning and saying, you know, it's, it's not that it's bad to teach, but teachers are a good example of how we use our words it matters and, and it, and it affects others and it can affect others in an eternal way. And so we should take our words seriously. So this is certainly not a great verse to start out a Sunday school teacher workshop with. Uh, This is certainly not a great verse to be able to start out, you know, any kind of teacher training with, because taken out of context, it would sound like we shouldn't teach at all. Well, as we go on, as we keep reading, we'll see that, He's not just touching, not just talking about teachers. He's talking about all of us and how we use our words. It matters. 
So when he says not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness, yeah, he gives both the the, the thing that he's warning them about, I right? don't become teachers. We have all these people who I would say probably because of the the Jewish, you know, what they've imported from their Jewish understanding that teachers as a law are highly respected and honored. And so I, I suspect there's a lot of people that want to be teachers within the congregations. But then you add to that this great background that you brought about the wandering uh, teachers who are coming in, also in the Jewish tradition, and being permitted to give, uh, frankly, an unqualified uh, uh, sermon. Uh, for the congregation. Um, I'm glad, first of all, that we don't do that in these days. You know, we, we have the instruction from Scripture to do things decently and in order, and I would suspect that not allowing that, I mean, I wouldn't just suspect it, Paul was addressing this very thing, um, not allowing this sort of just tons of errant preachers to lead the service is certainly not in order. It wasn't in order in Corinthians, and it wouldn't be in order today. But it also gives a lot more emphasis on the hearer to be in the word, to be able to judge the speech of the people teaching. And I think we've lost that a little bit, right? Because now, because of the certification process, which is a good thing, mind you, um, I think people listen to their, their pastors or their Sunday school teachers, and they go, okay, well, that's, that's just that's the gospel truth. I don't have to consider it any further which I don't think any pastor wants. I think pastors want people to consider these things, uh, check the scriptures, dive into it. Uh, what do you think, brother? You know, I, I regularly share with our people um, in worship and especially in Bible study that I say, you know, don't just take my word for it. Go back to scripture. And so go back. We all go back to God's word. And so it's not just my opinion or what Tim thinks. Uh, it's what does God's word say? And, you know, and, and if I stray, you know, if I err, uh, if I say the wrong thing or I'm not faithfully reflecting what God's word says, you know, I, I want people to tell me, I mean, please don't throw like a shoe in church, you know, but, <laughs> but, you know, can let me know and let me know nicely. But I want to know right. because it's not just me talking all of our authority, all of our teaching, everything comes from God's word, which is why sharing it with others is so important. Yeah, and I think there's this misunderstanding that pastors, um, you know, don't want to be corrected. Well, the truth is, we are striving to be as faithful to the scriptures as possible. So, even if accidentally, and hopefully it's always accidentally, we are unclear, or you know, we've just gone off the rails. Yet we want that. Now, you know, anybody can take criticism badly. So it's always important that we correct one another in gentleness. But yeah, that's something people are looking for. That's that being judged with greater strictness. I don't think it just applies to say standing before God in heaven and he says, well, you were given this vocation as teacher. Let's look at what you did with it. I think it's also people, at least at this time, are going to be listening to what you say. They're going to be judging what you say. So he says, not many of you should just aspire to want to become teachers. Now, it also makes sense then that when I or my DCE gets up in front of the congregation and is practically begging people to become Sunday school teachers, everybody's like, nope, nope. <laughs> I don't know if they have this particular verse in their head, but a lot of times there is this fear of, well, I don't know what to say. And that fear is not bad, but instead of just not doing anything, it should send you to the Bible to prepare yourself. But yeah, I think, I think this is a very important text. For anyone teaching... Uh, for myself, I also see great comfort th in this as well. It sounds like a very law heavy verse and there is certainly the law there, but, you know, but it's also comforting and knowing that when we teach, it's not just us teaching, uh, it's God's word. And so I say like, you know, in, in sermons or Bible study or counseling or one-on-one -on -one conversations, you know, like I'm not very creative, like I'm not very smart. All what I do is just say what God's word says and God's word works. Um, and, and how God shares his word with us, it works. It's powerful. It's effective. Uh, and it saves our lives and it changes our lives. Um, and as we continue reading here, we see how this, how words are powerful and how they're used. It does matter. 
Yeah, he also says, for we all stumble in many ways. So the apostle is including himself. So he's not being high and mighty. You know, he's not beginning the class saying, not many of you should become teachers like me. No, he is admitting something that is universal. And that is that the tongue is a small member and it boasts of great things, but, you know, it, it can do good things. That's what I think we get in these examples of the, their modern modes of transportation, you know, horse, ships, you know, look at all the great things that a tongue can do. But then just as there are good things, there are bad. Take us into that, brother. Hey, you know, I love how uh, James follows us up with, you know, verse two, you know, for we all stumble in many ways. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man able also to bridle his whole body that and in the examples that he's going to go on to use here he shares with us that you know our tongue even though it's a small part of the body it's powerful and so if you are able to always use your words perfectly then you are a perfect person well the natural follow-up of that is exactly what he says for we all stumble in many ways which means none of us use our words perfectly uh, none of us are able to perfectly use our words the way that God calls us to, and that is of benefit to our neighbor, which is the beauty of the gospel coming here because there is someone who has perfectly used his words. Uh, Jesus perfectly used his words all the time, and yet he still went to the cross for us. He still won the forgiveness, hope, and life for us. And so as James is writing here, He's writing to people who are already Christians. He's writing to people who already know the gospel. They already know Jesus loves them. He saves them. He went to the cross and won forgiveness for their sins. And so they know that. So now he's getting into what does it mean to be a Christian? And part of it is we acknowledge that we have all fallen short. As you know, so a great question for us to reflect on and think about, you know, is like when was a time or when was a situation when you did not use your words? as well as you should have. That's something we can all, we can all reflect on. It's like, what was, what was the time? And think about it for a moment and kind of have that in the back of your head as we keep going through these verses. Well, I can tell you, Pastor, I won't share them on the air, but boy, I can think of a lot of times. <laughs> and, and we all have, like he says, for we all stumble in many ways. You know, we, you know, for, for most of us, we probably do not have to think back very far. Mm-hmm. And so we don't have to think back very far in our day. Uh, and to think of a time when ah, I, I dropped the ball at that. That's, that's not how I f- should have phrased that. That's not how I should have responded. You know, there is this duality. You know, he, I believe he begins this in a positive way, saying that, you know, there are so, don't, don't just think that everything that the tongue says and does is just drenched in wickedness. And, you know, you might as well just take a vow of silence. In the same way that he's not encouraging people to never become teachers, He's also not encouraging people to never say anything. He's just wanting to use really realistic images to get into our hearts and minds that there is a danger and it's so hard to control. And it is, it's so hard. And for us to try and control it on our own is impossible for we all stumble in many ways, which makes us all the more grateful to have our forgiving and loving savior that Jesus Christ forgives us, that he uses his words correctly and that he uses his words to save us. Uh, I love the examples that he uses here of a horse uh, and a ship. Yeah, I'm not a horse person. Um, I've ridden a horse, but I've never owned one. And and yet you see like a a horse is such a a powerful animal. Even Even a small horse is still extremely strong and powerful. And how you steer the horse matters. And we've got a number of horse people uh, in our area and people who have horses, even in our neighborhood, people who have horses and, and how you steer the horse matters that it, this, this animal is by far stronger than you are bigger, stronger, faster, everything than the human riding it. Um, but then how you steer it matters. And, and it doesn't, and it doesn't take a lot of force to steer a trained horse, a horse that trusts you. Uh, that it doesn't take much force, but you just gently direct them which way to go. Uh, For us, uh, just two hours north of us is uh, Duluth, Minnesota. It's a a major harbor town. Uh, The Iron Range of northern Minnesota and a lot of the products of the area are able to be loaded onto ships. 
uh, and go out into Lake Superior through the Great Lakes and really anywhere in the world. And we love being able to go up there and to be able to see uh, the ships coming in and out. Now, there's this beautiful bridge where uh, the center part lifts up and these ships come in. And when you watch these ships come in, they're massive. I mean, these are ocean faring vessels. They're huge. And when they come on in, they're there's not much margin for error. Like when they're sliding through and fitting through that bridge and coming through that little canal way uh, into like the Harbor. I mean, there's like maybe 30 feet on each side of this giant ship before they just run aground and knock this giant bridge down. And yet when they come in every single time, it's just right on point. And you think of this giant, I mean, unbelievably heavy ship, especially when it's loaded down with cargo. And yet you look at the rudder on the back and you think, man, like that thing helps steer this giant ship. You know, they got the propeller, even the propellers on back. They're big, but compared to this giant ship, not that big. And so the, and so it is with the tongue. The tongue is a small part of our body. And yet God's wired it up to be used very powerfully. You know, we think of the old phrase, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. And yet they, they do though. They can. Exactly. You know, we say that right. old phrase and we all laugh at it because we're like, that's not true. <laughs> yeah. I think that phrase was invented by someone trying to cope with the fact that we are often torn apart by emotionally anyway, by people's words. And I think that phrase is invented to try to strengthen us against these attacks, um, either from others or from the carelessness of others, right? Not everybody who ends up hurting us with their tongue is doing it on purpose. It's just something that is uh, part of its nature in this unbelieving and wicked world. But we're going to get into that more in just a few minutes. We are right up against a break. So folks, when we come back, Pastor Heineke and I will continue our discussion of James chapter 3. We'll see you on the other side. What's happening in Germany's Lutheran churches? where Iranian refugees are flooding through the doors. What new opportunities for sharing the Christian faith are arising in communist Vietnam, and how can my church play a part? Mission speakers, all LCMS pastors from the Lutheran Heritage Foundation, will come to your church, free of charge, to preach and lead Bible studies tying into this exciting work going on all around the world. To schedule your speaker, call LHF at 800-554-0723. Welcome back to Thy Strong Word. I'm your host, Pastor Phil Wu. With me today is the Reverend Tim Heineke, pastor of New Life Lutheran Church in Hugo, Minnesota. So, Pastor, before the break, you were talking about just the, you're actually talking about the ships there in Duluth. And it is, it is, first of all, Duluth is an amazing town. It's it reminded me so much when I end up moving to Connecticut, Duluth reminds me so much of those harbor towns, even like Boston and the Long Island Sound and other places. But it's obviously on Lake Superior. It's not on the ocean, but it still just has this a great, this great feel to it. It's almost like a like a beach or an ocean town. But then as we move on to the chapter, he does start to focus a little bit more on the negative. This is we get into the warning about it. Uh, go ahead and take us through that. Absolutely. He, he lays out here, you know, in verse five, you know, so also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. And he goes through and he fleshes out the examples uh, that you had mentioned about, you know, how a uh, uh, forest fire yeah, and we experience terrible forest fires in our own country and, and around the world. And they're oftentimes started by something extremely small, um, a loose cigarette butt, a uh, unattended campfire uh, but something small starts this huge colossal forest fire and so same thing with our words that you know they're powerful they seem small but they are powerful and god's wired in great power to our words he goes through and he flashes out you know every kind of bird or reptile a sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind but no human being can tame the tongue is a restless evil full of dreadful poison and so there we think, wow, man, I mean, that sounds like we can do terrible bad with our tongues, which 
as sinners is unfortunately true. There are times when we can do terrible bad uh, with our tongues. And when we do that bad, again, we remember that James is writing here to Christians. He's writing to people who know their Savior. And so this is the beautiful thing that he's transitioning as he's moving into verse nine here. We get to see this beautiful gospel of how does God use his words towards us? He uses his words in beautiful gospel, beautiful forgiveness that God knows that we fall short. He knows, as James says, for we all uh, stumble in many ways. And that's exactly why he went to the cross for us. That when he speaks to us, he doesn't speak to us with harsh, fire-starting, setting a forest ablaze words. He speaks with us in the beautiful words of his word, the beautiful words of the gospel, that he looks at us and he says, I forgive you. I love you. And this, this is the joy that we have as Christians and knowing how we use our words. It matters. And as forgiving Christians, we have the joy of using our words in positive ways, in constructive ways. When he says, with it, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. And you're so right to illustrate that as we look to imitate Christ, we see in the the ways in which he uses his tongue to bless and uphold, and even to correct and rebuke. So to use the tongue to correct others or to rebuke them um, according to the scriptures isn't an evil use of the tongue. I think that in this day and age, so many people have equated correction or even gentle rebuking with you know hate speech or being being hateful towards others when that's what we're supposed to be doing with one another as we you know strive to live the life that God has called us to live but in this verse with it we bless our lord and father and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of god it reminds me of that saying you know oh do you kiss your mother with that mouth you know <laughs> you, people who are uh, you know, cursing or or being uncouth and and it's it, you know this phrase is you know do you with the same mouth that you might give your mother a loving peck on the cheek you're out there cussing up a storm and 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 telling dirty jokes or whatever it is it, you know it's just a uh, it shows that you're sort of a two-sided person. And here, the saint, right, Apostle James, explains it. He says, yeah, it's because that the tongue, you know, is 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 within this world that has uh, is always constantly trying to draw us back into ourselves and away from Christ. And as a result, our tongues can do two things, the good and the bad. And just as the table of demons and the table of Christ can't coexist, Neither should our tongues, you know, neither should they be blessing our Lord and Father and turning around and cursing people whom God loves. Well, this is a a beautiful example that James lays out uh, for us here of how, you know, of salt water and fresh water, of of, of figs and olives and, you know, how, you know, fig trees produce figs, you know, grapevines produce grapes, you know, uh, salt water is salt water. A freshwater spring, it spits out fresh water. And so for us as Christians, we get to think about how we use our words and that we want it to be that fresh water. We want it to be that beautiful good news of sharing with others. And because, as James says, for we all stumble in many ways, that when we do not use our words properly, which is inevitable as sinners on this side of heaven, uh, we will use our words improperly at some point. So when we do not use our words correctly, the very next words out of our mouth as forgiven Christians is, I'm sorry. And there's incredible power in that. There's something about owning up to your mistakes Um, in the same way that a teacher shouldn't be afraid to say that they don't know. They have to go look something up or or it's just something they're not familiar with, right? That that builds confidence that the person, when they are speaking, are are speaking the truth or things they know about. And so we as uh, Christians, whenever we find ourselves, you know, being tempted by the world or using our tongue in ways that God doesn't approve, uh, once we recognize that, you know, it's important that we, to build up those relationships, admit our faults. And sometimes that doesn't happen immediately, though, right? Sometimes it takes uh, a rebuke or an admonishment from either the person who was 
uh, offended or the or someone else to say, hey, you may not know it, but you know the way that you said that or what you said just probably wasn't taken well. And then that's where that humility comes in. James is always connecting faith and humility throughout his entire letter because it takes a humble heart guided by God's wisdom to be able to recognize that we're not perfect. You know, only Christ was perfect. And it's a very good thing that Christ was perfect and is perfect for us because that's why we have the beauty of saying, I forgive you. When I when we say, I'm sorry to God, he says, I forgive you to us. Uh, that there's that that we're able to humble ourselves to God and humble ourselves with one another. You know, all too often, you know, when we uh, apologize and, you know, my kids are hilarious at picking this out in movies and TV shows, and now I'm more conscientious of it, you know, but in everyday conversation or, you know, inevitably on movies and TV shows, when someone says, I'm sorry, when they apologize, the response back is rarely, I forgive you. It's usually something like, oh, don't worry about it. Oh, never mind. Oh, I'll forget about it. Oh, it's oh, it's no big deal. Oh, oh, it's all right. And for us as Christians, we have a different response that we say, I forgive you. Oh, when we think of the tongue, when we think of communication, uh, a term that's oftentimes used in uh, kind of counseling circles and relationship advice uh, is a concept of emotional bidding. Uh, that when we're talking and when we're interacting with uh, each other, it's like we're bidding, like bidding at an auction. We're bidding to be able to establish a connection between us. And when we respond to someone, we can essentially think of responding in three different ways. We can turn toward the person, turn against the person, or turn away from the person. Turning toward them is that we uh, acknowledge what they said and respond back directly to them. Uh, turning against them is then saying, you know, harshly against them and uh, going against the person and turning uh, away from them is where we disregard kind of what they said. Perhaps like a great example is, uh, you know, uh, one spouse asking the other, do you know where the car keys are? I mean, I'm sure it's a completely hypothetical situation that nobody's ever encountered, but, you know, just bear with me. But, you know, hey, do you know where the car keys are? Well, a turn toward response would be, oh, they're right over there. Or, oh, I'm not sure. Or maybe they're, or maybe they're still in the coat pocket. You're kind of turning toward them. You're acknowledging them. A turning against them, the turning against response to, do you know where the car keys are? Turning against response would be, well, sure sounds like you've lost them again. Or I don't know, you were the last one to drive the car. Yeah, it's turning against them. Um, you're responding in that negative way, uh, negatively affecting the relationship. And um, the turning away response would be, I wonder what we should eat for supper. You know, you're just, you're not even acknowledging the person's question. You're co completely turning away. Well, when we think of how we use our words, we, we, you know, most people get it pretty quick. All right, the turning toward, that's the most positive. That's the one we want to go for. And so then we think, all right, well, then what, you know, well, then what's the worst response? Well, oftentimes we think the turning against is the worst response. When in fact, the turning away is actually what damages relationships more than turning against. Not acknowledging the person, not acknowledging what they said actually damages the relationship more than responding harshly in a negative way. Uh, it's kind of like the old saying, you know, that the, the opposite of love is not hate, it's indifference. Uh, and so that when we respond, we want to respond in a connection to one another. We want to build our relationships. So when someone says, I'm sorry, when we respond with, oh, forget about it, well, that's actually a turning away response. We're actually dismissing their apology. Uh, we're actually dismissing them confessing their mistake and saying, ah, forget about it. Or, ah, it's no big deal. Well, it's obviously not a big deal because the person's apologizing. It dismisses the you know courage it takes to apologize. When people have to admit they're wrong, especially in a world that 
doesn't like to hand out forgiveness, right? We we have forgiveness, which is very unique to our Lord and his interaction with the world. And he calls for us to interact with each other with forgiveness. So when you basically ask for forgiveness, but don't receive it, yeah, that can certainly be turning away or turning against, you know, because we uh, always want to be building up those relationships. And I think that we need to make sure we're building up our relationships with the world too, to model this behavior uh, so that others can see, yeah, it's, it isn't nothing. Even if the person who is being apologized to uh, didn't think it was a big deal, it's still important for them to remember that to the person apologizing, obviously it was because they've come to you with an apology. So to dispense or to withhold, I should say, to withhold that absolution, that forgiveness would certainly be misusing the tongue, right? And it would be breaking down your relationship with that person. Uh, but as you also said, it's also part of our nature now, right, Pastor? I mean, we just sort of almost by, by um, you know, just automatic response will say, oh, don't worry about it. And I think that, to and, I, and I've noticed this in my own behavior too, for us to be very intentional about saying, I forgive you, is uh, something that is really important because it also confesses something about our God, which we always want more opportunities to do, right? There's opportunities to, to share the gospel and to share Christ's love in our everyday conversations, uh, at, whether we're at home, at school, at work, uh, with family, in the grocery store, and anywhere. And, and, and sharing God's love, sharing his word, and using that our words in a Christian way does not mean that we have to always be quoting Bible verses. Now, memorizing scripture is obviously a great thing, but we don't always have to be quoting Bible verses. Sometimes it's as simple as saying, I forgive you. And God has wired up power in those words. There's power in the forgiveness. There's power in how he has wired up our tongue to be used. Even though it is the small part of our body, there's power in it. And that we get to heal relationships by saying, I forgive you. And if it was no big deal, or honestly, if you didn't even notice what happened, you can say, I forgive you. Uh, I Honestly, I, I wasn't upset about it. Or I didn't even notice that you said that or that you did that. But we still say, I forgive you. Because there's power in those words from Christ. And there's power in those words that we have the joy of sharing with each other. And not to belabor the point, but how often have we been the recipient of someone's apology and then we say something like, oh, yeah, don't worry about it, except we'd been fuming about it for some time. You know, so it's sometimes flat out dishonest when we say, oh, it's no big deal when it was a big deal to us. So I, I think that it's just interesting how the, the human psyche can interact with with God's wisdom. And speaking of wisdom, we actually have a few, um, just a few verses that we've not covered yet. So I want to make sure I get those read and out on the table to include in our conversation, because here the Apostle James turns to our attitudes. It's a little less specific about the tongue, but it still relates because it's about the way we think. So here we are. We're going to read verses 13 through 18 and finish up the chapter. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So God calls us to control our tongues, use them for only good purposes. Um, you know, be sure to put bits in our mouths so that we can control our passions. Also, we should have wisdom, uh, wisdom that's from above and not demonic, no jealousy, no selfish ambition, and be peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy, good, full of good fruits, impartial, sincere, and then try to make peace. Wow. You know, it's as if the Lord wants us to uh, 
imitate Christ. And of course, of course he does. And that's what the apostle is giving us here, because how many of these things, brother, could we just one-to-one attach to Christ? And while he fulfills them perfectly on our behalf, James would be the first apostle probably to tell you that doesn't let us off the hook in terms of striving to live these things out by faith. And these are uh, an incredible way that he connects this. Um, and he did a great job connecting the, you know, with the words that God uses with us. And this is this, especially verse 17. And uh, we can see, we read these verses and it's hard to not think of Jesus, you know, a pure and peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial, sincere. Uh, this, this is Christ. This is a Christ's love for us. And as his forgiven people, this is what we get to strive towards sharing with others. Uh, you know, as we think through this, you know, this word wisdom, as a wisdom that pops up a number of times uh, in, in James and all of scripture, especially Old Testament, the Proverbs, you know, we speak of wisdom, especially here in the Greek. You know, it's this word sophos, you know, where we get the word sophomore from, you know, that wisdom is not always what we call book smarts. Uh, wisdom is oftentimes understood in kind of what we usually call street smarts or life smarts. And, and we know that as we kind of, as we, as we grow, as we interact with others, as we go through the different stages of our lives, you know, we kind of see, all right, so there, there's a book smarts, you know, we kind of know things on paper, but there's also life smart where you just, you get it. It's life smart. Wisdom is, is practical. And this is the beauty of James and all of God's word is that it's practical. It actually makes a difference in our lives. And we see the negative examples here, but also the positive examples. And so a great uh, devotional question for us to think on, you know, is, you know, when we're making decisions, like when are we tempted to think of ourselves first? Kind of, what kind of a situation What kind of a group of people, um, what kind of maybe our own anxiety or stress level, kind of when are we tempted to think of ourselves first? And and this helps it make sense that then we are more tempted to use our words in a negative way in those situations. As we come to especially verse 17 here, as he lists out these, these beautiful things. You know, with the, but the wisdom from above as first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. That as we use our words in a positive way, as we say, I'm sorry, and when we fall short and when we say, I forgive you, when others apologize, that it's practical, it's wisdom, it's life smart, it's street smart, it actually makes a difference in our lives that actually builds our relationships. And as we go through that list in verse 17, uh, I'd encourage each of us to be able to take some time to reflect on that and to think, what jumps out at you in that list? And all of us would pick something different, but what jumps out at you when you read through verse 17, this list of positive things? And whatever jumps out at you first is probably likely what God's given wisdom will have the greatest impact in your decision making um that whatever jumps out at you that's something that's important to you um and that's something that when you're in a situation by interacting with others and when you're tempted to use your words in a bad way if being impartial is really important to you well then you think when can i use my words great in a fair setting when i want to be impartial or if the word sincere jumps out at you you know why is it important for you to be sincere. Why is it important for you to have others around you who are sincere? That each of these positive characteristics connects with each of us differently and at different times in our lives, that they all have uh, this incredible words of blessing uh, for us. And as verse 18 says, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. That as we use our words, it's not just good for others. It's good for ourselves. Like we actually benefit when we use our words in a proper way. We actually benefit when we acknowledge our mistakes, say, I'm sorry. And we actually benefit when we say, I forgive you. I think many people, if they listen to our Corinthian show would recall wisdom from the spirit being discussed by Paul 
you know, and oftentimes Paul and James are put at odds with each other, which is certainly not fair to either of them because uh, both apostles inspired by the Holy Spirit, their messages are completely cohesive, and this is yet another place. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2, 6, he says, Yet among the mature, we do impart wisdom, although it is not a wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away. Uh, And then he continues, he says, but we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. And so here, when James is giving us all these things that we must be or should strive to be, which is true, he always keeps at the forefront where these come from. This is not worldly wisdom. This is wisdom from above. So wouldn't you agree, Pastor, that when we strive, even though we'll be imperfect, when we strive to be peaceable, gentle, open to reason, etc., impartial, sincere, the world doesn't really recognize those things, And which is funny because the world calls for these things, yet when the Christian lives them out, we just don't fit in with the rest of the world. If you actually live or strive to live in the way which God calls us to live through these words, do you think you'll have an easier time in the world or a harder time? And certainly it depends on the context, but I think in some ways you might actually have a harder time. You know, people who are less agreeable tend to do better in business. People who are less gentle tend to find positions of leadership. People who are um, not so full of mercy and good fruits uh, sometimes uh, in, in find themselves quite wealthy because they are unconcerned with the plight of people that aren't themselves. You know, they're very narcissistic. So from the world standards of success, often the things of God just don't um, match or work. And so I think that this peacemaking that St. James ends this section with, of course, the The chapters are all artificial by the editors, but the section is ended with this idea of a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace, is directed at the reality that we live not to please the world, but to, you know, be instruments of God, workers for the harvest, bringing others to Christ through our actions, which open the doors. And then, of course, through the proclamation of the gospel. Absolutely. Well, on this and this harvest of righteousness as practical as the wisdom of God's word is and making a difference in our lives, this harvest may not be till the life to come. So this peace that we that we want to be able to experience may not be on this side of heaven. And yet, just because we don't get just because we don't experience the benefits of it perhaps as we want to on this side of heaven, it's still God's plan. He's still faithful through it all. Um, When we share this word of forgiveness, that sometimes people are, in my experience, caught off guard. You know, kind of somebody says, you know, bumps into you with their uh, shopping cart uh, in the grocery aisle. And they say, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, And you respond, oh, I forgive you. You Yeah, sometimes they give you a weird look. Now, sometimes they're like, well, what, what do you mean you forgive me? You know, and it's like, well, you apologized. I, I, I forgave you. You know, that, and even, even honestly, even for many of us Christians that were just so programmed to the responses, the turning away responses of, oh, to forget about it. Ah, it's no big deal. Oh, psh, ah, whatever. It's okay. Oh, water under the bridge. Uh, we're so programmed to these turning away responses that even for us, forcing ourselves to actually say the words, I forgive you does not come naturally to that old Adam, that sinner inside of us. And it takes, it takes effort. And sometimes there's a learning curve where people are like, well, what do you mean? uh, You forgive me. You know, sometimes people are caught off guard and it strikes up a conversation or some weird looks or a weird response of like, well, what do you mean you forgive me? You know, they're expecting the response of, ah, forget about it. Ah, no big deal. I had a situation where someone said they were sorry, and I actually said, oh, you know what? I forgive you, and it made them mad, and it made them mad because they were saying they were sorry, but they didn't really mean it, and so when I said, I forgive you, it triggered in their mind, well, what do you, I have to be forgiven for, 
<laughs> right? It's like, right. well, you just, like, I didn't do yeah, anything you just wrong. apologize. But while that is a possible reaction, it certainly shouldn't turn people off from following the example you're setting forth of using this language of forgiveness because it opens up those conversations. You know, I, I forgive you because, well, frankly, I do a lot of things too, and I'm forgiven by God. And next thing you know, you're having a conversation about God with perhaps a stranger in the grocery store. And that's, that's amazing. That's amazing. And it is so much better than what you said before, you know, just, uh, you know, beating them over the head with memorized Bible verses as good as it is to memorize the Bible. Sharing the gospel and sharing our faith is, is even simple. Yeah. And can be done in simple ways as just saying, I forgive you, you know, and we're able to, we're able to, uh, sow in peace. And so as he ends this, James ends this section with, that we're able to sow in this peace. We're scattering these seeds of peace, uh, in our relationship. And one thing that we can, I think everybody can agree on that we could all benefit from is more peace, peace in our lives, peace in our relationships, in our societies, in our workplaces, our families, you know, we can all use more peace. And that peace comes first and foremost from our God who shares his peace, his forgiveness with us. And so we do our best to share that peace with others. And when we fall short, we own up to it and we say, I'm sorry. I'd like to thank my guest this morning, the Reverend Tim Heineke, pastor of New Life Lutheran Church in Hugo, Minnesota. Thank you, Pastor, for being on the show. Thank you for having me. And thank you too, dear listener, for tuning in to Thy Strong Word. I've been your host, Pastor Phil Boo. Tomorrow, we unroll the scroll just a little bit more to chapter four, when the Reverend Mark Loder will guide us through St. James' teaching on resisting the devil. It's an episode that I hope you won't resist. Until then, may God's peace and blessings be with you all as we pray. Father, keep us in thy strong word. Mm